Well, I just want to add one extra vote of thanks. It's been my limited experience in organizing these things that they're really, you need one motive force, one person to get things done. And in this case, no, make no mistake, it was Juan. So I want to second. Well, it, it's, it's late. I had a chance to have my say last night. So let me just show a picture of Nadi that I particularly like. And uh, I think we were uh, recovering after a very arduous seminar at Stanford. And I have to say, it's impossible for me to think of Nadi as intimidating with this picture in my head. <laughs> well, the question that I want to talk about is a physics question today. This is a physics uh, conference. And the question is, what accounts for the finiteness of the black hole entropy from the bulk point of view? After many years and the work of many people in this room, we have a very good understanding of the finiteness of the black hole entropy, especially from the point of view of the ADS-CFT correspondence, from the boundary point of view. The entropy of a large black hole in ADS is finite because the entropy of a thermal quantum field theory, at least in finite volume, is finite. It's a beautiful answer. But from the bulk point of view, if we're living inside the bulk, the answer is mysterious, deep, and we have to know the answer. Slightly more uh, specifically, for an observer, a bulk observer hovering above the horizon, outside the horizon, watching it, what are the signatures, as this person watches the horizon, of the Planckian graininess of the horizon? We think there should be some, but we don't know what it is or why it's there. So uh, I'm sorry to tell you that I won't be able to answer that question today. But what I want to do is take some small first steps toward addressing this question. Well, some time ago, one suggested a simple diagnostic of this graininess. Let's imagine that O is a bulk operator hovering above the horizon. It's really a smeared boundary operator in ADS-CFT. And think about the two-point function as a function of time of this operator. Well, let's evaluate it using boundary variables. It's just some thermal expectation value of some quantity in the, in the large black hole case. Inserting complete sets of states is just this double sum over states of the conformal field theory. With matrix elements, a Boltzmann factor, and phases that tell you about the time development. Now at short times, we can treat the spectrum as a continuum, these matrix elements very smoothly, and this two-point function generically decays exponentially. And we have an excellent understanding of this from the bulk gravitational point of view. These are just the quasi-normal modes that cause the black hole to relax after an initial perturbation. But at long times, things are different. We expect that this black hole, this finite entropy black hole, to have discrete energy levels because of finite entropy. And we expect these energy levels to be generically non-degenerate, essentially because the black hole is a chaotic system. Well, then at long times, where you cannot treat these as a continuum, these phases oscillate in an erratic way. And in fact, this two-point function starts oscillating erratically. It no longer decreases. And in fact, it's exponentially small. There's some way that this observer hovering above the horizon watches this wave smoothly settle on the horizon, but after a very long time, it stops settling. It does something else. And that stopping of settling is clearly a non-perturbative effect in quantum gravity, and it's the effect that we want to uh, focus on today. Related phenomena were discussed by these offers in the context of de Sitter space. And Barbon and Eliezer made an important comment about this decay that I'll come to later. Well, we want to focus on this phenomenon, the culprit, as I hope I uh, expressed, were these oscillating phases. 
So to make our life simpler, let's consider an even simpler diagnostic that just has the phases. So we strip out the matrix elements and we consider this closely uh, related quantity. The double sum, here we have a Boltzmann weight for both energies to control them, of these oscillating phases. We can write this double sum as just a partition function, which would be a single sum, at beta plus it, times the partition function at beta minus it, or as we'll call it, zz star of t. And this is the quantity we want to study today. In the context of black holes, this quantity is introduced by Papadidimus and Raju. It's very closely related to something that's been studied a long time in the quantum chaos literature called the spectral form factor. And sometimes I'll drop into this language. So this is what we want to study. It clearly has whatever is going on in these oscillated phase, oscillating phases contained in it. Well, what are the properties of this ZZ star quantity? There it is again. Well, at time zero, it's clearly just the partition function squared. If we assume the levels are discrete, we're in finite entropy, and non-degenerate, as we're going to expect from chaos, we can imagine taking a long time average of this quantity, integrating it over a long time interval, let's say from minus capital T naught to T naught, divided by that interval. And when you do this, these oscillating phases will eventually cancel out since these things are not degenerate. The only term that will survive is the m equals n term. So in that limit, just keeping m equals n reduces to a single sum, and you get one partition function, but at twice the beta, because you have two terms there. So in the long time averaging limit, this quantity goes to z of two beta. So as you go from a short time interval, where you have z of beta squared, at long time, you have z of two beta. Now, partition functions are generically e to the entropy. So at short times, you have e to the 2s. At long times, it's e to the s, just a factor of two. But remember, the entropy is an enormous number. Let's say it's proportional to n squared. So this is an exponential change. It's the nature of this change as you go from short time to long time that I want to talk about today. How does this function change? What's, what's its shape? Well, this is hard to study because uh, it's a non-perturbative phenomenon. In fact, a very subtle non-perturbative phenomena that we don't really have tools to study. But recently a tool has been introduced, this very simple model that seems to capture something about black holes called well, the sachdevier kateyev model that's been discussed twice already in this conference. It's a promising system in which to investigate these questions. I hope I can convince you of that. Well, a large group of us, this really large group, has been trying to understand this for actually well, the better part of a year. And I'm sorry to say this work's still in progress, but I think I'm in the, at, the, at the point now where I can tell you some of the things we've learned. The enormous size of this collaboration, well, it, it's basically inappropriate, but it's not completely inappropriate because some aspects of this work are like an experimental collaboration. Okay. Well, here's just a review of the sachdev yekatev model. In case any of you were sleeping, well, at least twice during this past conference. It's a quantum mechanics built out of Majorana fermions, and Majorana fermions, where four of them are coupled together at a time. No space, just quantum mechanics. And the couplings are random, Gaussian distributed with this variance. This letter J sets the scale of energies, and we'll often set J to one. We'll measure times and temperatures in those units. And importantly, this model has a finite dimensional Hilbert space. You group two Majoranas to make a Dirac, the dimension of the Hilbert space is 2 to the n over 2. Now, often when people discuss matrices, and certainly I have always done this, I think of n by n matrices, okay? So we need another letter to describe the size of this matrix. We tried m, it sounds a little bit too much like n on a Skype call. We tried k, but k has got a lot of other meanings. So we settled on l. The rank of this Hamiltonian is L, which is 2 to the n over 2. n plays a different role in this situation. 
And in fact, this interplay between N and L will be a big part of the story. Why is the SYK model potentially a good model to analyze this? Well, as we've seen, it's maximally chaotic. By that, I mean it saturates the chaos bound by this criterion of the out-of-time order correlator. It has, in some sense, some kind of bulk interpretation. There seems to be a gravitational sector, this dilaton gravity. It's got, that part has enhanced amplitude. It has stringy states. I should have put stringy in quotes. We don't really know what they are. And it has other stuff, these non-singlet fields. So there seems like there's some kind of bulk interpretation, but its, it's actual nature is, is somewhat mysterious. Hopefully, and I, I, I think it's the case, the lessons we're going to draw are sufficiently generic that they won't depend on great detail on the exact nature of the bulk interpretation. We're doing this J-average. We're studying a set of Hamiltonians and, and doing ensemble averages of things, and we'll do that for the quantities we're interested in. And this has a number of advantages. First of all, the J average moves the energy levels around a little bit, and so it averages out these oscillating phases. So in fact, we don't have to do a time average anymore. We expect ZZ star to be a smooth function of T after we average over J. So as our target, we can actually think of calculating a smooth function of time after J averaging. Furthermore, as, as, as Juan explained, you can rewrite the partition function of this model in terms of these collective fields that describe uh, the, the bilinear average. These are bilocal in time, G on shell is uh, chi chi. And this is an exact rewrite of the model. This isn't some effective theory. You traded in the fermions for two bilocal fields in time with an action, and n appears here as a saddle point parameter, and the perturbative expansion is 1 over n. This is, in some vague sense, as a proxy for a bulk theory, okay? You think you could reconstruct whatever bulk there is by these bilinears, these bilocal g's and sigmas. And so, in some sense, what we want to do is find whatever phenomena we find, and then, ultimately, reinterpret them in terms of this bulk proxy theory. That's a part we haven't got very far on. I'll just make a couple of comments. But that's the goal. Last, as I mentioned, the Hilbert space of this model, it's built out of fermions, is finite dimensional. To pick a number out of the air, let's say you have 34 Majorana fermions. The dimension of this Hilbert space is about 128,000. Well, numerics are feasible now. We have no other obvious tools, but we can actually study this baby model of quantum gravity numerically. And that's what we started doing. Okay. This end turns out to be big enough uh, for some purposes, at, at least the ones, the, but not, not for all. But it's as big as we can do. Okay, so without further ado then, let me show you our central result. This is ZZ star for the Sachdevier-Kateyev model. This is a log-log plot. This is a million time steps. This is an exponentially large range. This is ZZ star normalized, so at time equals zero, it's one. And I have to tell you, we've been staring at plots like this a lot the last 10 months, so we've had to give names to this topography, okay? We call this the slope. We call this the dip. I guess that's a pretty natural reason. This is the ramp, and this is the plateau. Well, these are the names. What are these things? Well, uh, one we understand. This plateau actually keeps going forever. This is a million time step. It just keeps going. This is this long time average that I spoke about. And in fact, this is given by, by that formula of Z of 2 beta. Okay. What's the rest? This is the way it goes from early time to this time average. What is this funny shape? And that's a good part of what I'm going to try to explain to you. This, we think, is characteristic of uh, thermal quantum systems that are highly chaotic, including black holes. Well, it's a mysterious, so the first thing you do is you try to make a model of your model. Okay? And 
we have chaotic systems, and there's a long history and set of intu intuitions that chaotic quantum systems typically have fine-grained energy level statistics described by random matrix theory. This is an idea that went, uh, it's actually a Princeton idea. It goes back to Wigner, to Dyson, and more recently there are concrete conjectures about semi-classical systems by these authors and many others. So this leads us to consider a simple model where we take the SYK Hamiltonian, it's an L by L matrix, and model it by M, an L by L Hermitian random matrix. Okay. The SYK model, even though it's got some randomness injected, it's got these J's that are random, there's only N to the fourth of them. M here has L squared, exponentially large random numbers. So we've injected even more randomness, and sometimes the underlying philosophy here is if you make things really random, things become simple again. So this is the uh, normalizing factor for this probability distribution. These are Gaussian random variables. If they're Hermitian, this is called the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And we take an M, and we compute ZZ star, and then we average over M with this uh, weight. In fact, if we set beta equal zero, this is just called the spectral form factor of random matrix theory, which is something in the uh, quantum chaos and random matrix community has been computed for many years. Now, in fact, I should say this connection between random matrix theory and the SYK model was first uh, discussed by you, Ludwig, and Xu, who studied very near neighbor eigenvalue correlations. And our interest is in these long range correlations that in Fourier transform are relatively short times. They also pointed out a very interesting n mod 8 variation in the ensemble. You go from GUE to GOE to GSE, but I'm afraid I won't be able to talk about that today. I just don't have time. All right, so now without further ado, we could do analytic calculations. Brezan and Hikami have done a tour de force. It's easier for us, since we're geared up, we just generated a large number of random Hermitian matrices, and here is the result of that numerical calculation. Same ZZ star, same beta, and the essential point of today, if you take nothing else away from today, is that this picture looks a lot like that picture. That's SYK, that's random matrix theory. They kind of look the same, okay? In particular, notice there's a slope and a ramp and a plateau. We now can understand what those features mean because we can understand them certainly in this model. So now let me tell you what they mean in random matrix theory. Um, again, this is just the plateau is the non-zero contribution. What's about the rest? Well, what about the rest? So I have to give you a lightning review of random matrix theory. This is the probability density. You analyze this by going to the eigenvalue basis, E sub i are the eigenvalues of the random matrix. The change of variables produces this famous Jacobian called the Vandermond determinant squared that makes eigenvalues repel. And if you can coarse grain and you represent the eigenvalues by a density, you have an action for the density that looks like this. You have exponentiating this, you have density, density correlations with a logarithmic repulsion. Eigenvalues logarithmically repel. They don't like to be on top of each other. And then this Gaussian trap keeping them confined. And this is called the Dyson gas. Okay. Well, if you stationarize this, you ask what distribution of eigenvalues makes this, extremizes this, you find the saddle point is given by the Wigner semicircle law. This is that same data blocked into a histogram, and lo and behold, it looks like a semicircle. In these normalizations, it runs from minus two to two. There's L eigenvalues you're stuffing in here, so the smallest spacing between adjacent eigenvalues is one over L. That's very small. Remember, L is exponential in N, so that's a very tiny spacing. And it defines a time scale that we're being interested in, inverse to that, a time scale of order L. So that's a time scale exponential in N, exponential in entropy. It's the time scale that lets you probe 
the smallest eigenvalue spacing. Well, now we can ask about this early part, the slope. Well, very early time, you can compute ZZ star, you can ignore the, um, this is averaged over M, you can ignore the, the correlations here and approximate it by the factorized correlation function. So the partition function itself is just the integral over the Wigner semicircle of e to the minus beta plus i t times energy. So you're just taking roughly the Fourier transform of the Wigner semicircle with a thermal damping. Well, if the temperature is kind of, if beta is kind of large, you're focusing on the low energy end. This is a square root vanishing. You're integrating a square root singularity like this by scaling. This goes like one over time to the three halves. All right, and there's L because you have L eigenvalues. So ZZ star is the square of that. It goes like L squared over T cubed. This is a log plot. The straight line is accurately T cubed. So what this slope is, is it tells you something about the low energy edge of the spectrum, its coarse grain shape. It's nothing to do with the fine structure. It's the coarse grain shape. Now at later times, fluctuations become important. You care about what Z and Z star are doing. If you separate out the N equals M term, you just get Z of two beta. But the N not equal to M term is given by the eigenvalue, eigenvalue pair correlation function, essentially Fourier transformed. So essentially, Z, Z star is the Fourier transform of the eigenvalue pair correlation function. And this is what's called the spectral form factor. Okay. So what you're mapping out in time is the Fourier transform of how eigenvalues are correlated. Well, this object, the spectral form factor, sorry, the, the eigenvalue correlation function has been known for the GUE ensemble for, I mean, guess of order 50 years. These authors, Dyson, Godin, Meta, figured this out. And the answer, if you focus near the center of the semicircle, away from the edges, is up to numerical factors that I've set equal to one, just this formula. It's given by the sine kernel a basic uh, ingredient in, in uh, random matrix theory. This is the function. This is what it looks like. This is energy difference. This is correlation. When the eigenvalues are on top of each other, the, the density vanishes because they repel. At long distances, you just go to the mean density. And you wiggle a little bit, and then you approach the mean density by a 1 over energy squared approach. If you take that Fourier transform, the Fourier transform of this is that, a ramp and a plateau. I've included the M equals N term back. So what the ramp and the plateau are diagnosing is this eigenvalue, eigenvalue correlation function. In the proper normalization, the plateau height is L. That's just one partition function if beta is equal to zero. The ramp is just a linear line. This characteristic break is at this time scale set by the eigenvalue spacing. It's a time L. So you have a linear function, T, running from 0 to L, and then it's at height L. That's the characteristic topography of this function. Now, for time shorter than this break time, we'll call the plateau time, L, you can average over this rapidly varying sine squared factor. The pair correlation function is just given by this inverse square. This is what gives the ramp. The ramp is lower than the plateau because the eigenvalues are anti-correlated. They repel. There's a minus sign here. Now, this inverse square is a very interesting formula. It says that long wavelength fluctuations, an eigenvalue here and here, don't like to be very floppy. As an alternative, let me just imagine this eigenvalue gas just had nearest neighbor springs coupling them. Then the pair correlation function would be given by studying the one-dimensional Laplacian inverse. The one-dimensional Laplacian grows linearly in separation. That would be a floppy 
set of eigenvalues. This doesn't grow, this decays. The set of eigenvalues is rigid, and this phenomenon is referred to as spectral rigidity. The Vandermont squared is very much like the, the uh, Laughlin wave function of the quantum Hall effect. The same phenomenon there is called the incompressibility of the fractional quantum Hall effect fluid. And we see now that spectral rigidity is the origin of the ramp. Okay. The plateau is essentially uh, these eigenvalues being on the phases canceling. The approach to that is the spectral rigidity of the, of the spectrum. The fact that eigenvalues form this very rigid, almost crystalline gas. So now we can be a little more quantitative. We have a slope that goes like L squared over T cubed. We have a ramp that goes linearly in time. There's a complicated thing here, but the scale is set by just asking when this function intersects that function. And that, even at this late hour, we can all do. This time, which we call the dip time, is the square root of L. This time, the plateau time is L, this is the square root of L. Their ratio is L to the minus a half, which is e to the minus the entropy of the system over two. These are exponentially separated. This is an exponentially late time, so is this, but there's an exponentially long period where spectral rigidity dominates this quantity. Okay. So there's a new time scale that's made its appearance. It's not just this ultra late time when the nearest neighbor's spacing. It's the time when long range spectral rigidity dominates the behavior of the function. Well, now let's try to repeat the analysis in our model black hole. Well, we assume the ramp and plateau are given by random matrix theory, since the pictures look the same and there's this very strong idea that random matrix dynamics drives the short range well, drives the uh, statistics of eigenvalues in chaotic systems. We now need to analyze the slope, the early time behavior, to see when it joins on. Well, at low temperature and large n, the SYK free energy, or its partition function, is given by the dominant large n saddle. And it's that of the near extremal black hole. Juan described a little bit about that today. The free energy is given by this. This is the entropy above extremality. There's the zero temperature entropy, and this is the one loop correction. This looks like a partition function that looks like that. A power law prefactor in beta, uh, one over beta that's a linear near extremal entropy, and this is zero temperature entropy. We can then try to calculate ZZ star by assuming at early time, which is correct, that this approximately is factorized. Then all we do is analytically continue that formula in time. This is analytically continuing beta to beta plus it. And taking its modulus squared, you get a formula like this. This thing is in the exponent, so as time gets large, this drops like a bomb. So in this approximation, this quantity is given by 1 over t squared to the 3 halves, which is called 1 over t cubed with a coefficient that's twice the uh, e to the twice the zero temperature entropy. We see here that large t is a little bit like large beta. This i sometimes matters and sometimes doesn't. So again, we're seeing long time behavior that's a power law presumably dictated by the edge of the SYK spectrum. The very low temperature dynamics is governed by this reparametrization mode that Juan discussed, the soft mode in the system. And the dynamics of this mode is described by the Schwarzian action. Now, this produces beta over n perturbative corrections. Remember, j is set to 1. This is a nonlinear action that has interaction terms. Now, at large time, if you analytically continue, these go like beta plus it over n. So at large time, these effects get larger. And so, in fact, for times larger in n, it's hard to analyze what's going on. It's a big, interesting problem to know what the time dependence the Schwarzian derivative action predicts. Okay. Numerics are only marginally useful because it turns out there's large dimensionless coefficients 
that Juan and Douglas found, like there's 16s multiplying things like this. So the numerics give a hint, but the, they, they don't allow us to be conclusive. Well, one thing you can see is that when time is large, beta doesn't matter much. So you expect whatever is happening, the behavior to be essentially beta independent. So using that hint, we can make a kind of a heuristic argument to bound the dip time, this time, at low enough t by assuming the slope is governed by the low energy reparameterization mode. And then the slope would only depend weakly on temperature. I don't know why I called it t instead of beta, but remember, beta is 1 over the temperature. So this part is essentially independent of temperature, but this plateau is going exponentially as you go to higher temperature because the entropy is going up linearly in temperature. So this stuff is going up and out rapidly. This thing is independent. So in fact, the plateau time is shooting off to the right. This thing is staying fixed. So the dip time is growing far less quickly. This bounds the dip time over the plateau plateau time by an exponentially small number. So again, there, if, this, if this argument is correct, there will be an exponentially large hierarchy between these two times and an exponentially long period where long-range spectral rigidity describes the physics of this model black hole. Now, th we think this is actually a really crude lower bound. This could be as early as the entropy time when this perturbation series starts crapping out. And finding this is a big, interesting question and involves understanding the dynamics of the Schwarzian system. Well, we now can try to apply these ideas, these intuitions, to uh, the canonical example, let's say, of ADS-CFT, which is Super Yang Mills theory. Well, black holes in the system are known to saturate the chaos bound at large at Tuff coupling. So if any system is going to be chaotic and have random matrix level statistics, this is a good candidate. So let's assume that the fine-grained energy level statistics are described by random matrix theory. Um, I probably, let's, let's say you're a GUE, which means you break every symmetry you can find at a theta angle to break time reversal. Otherwise, you can deal with GOE. And one important difference here, and this is a, an observation that Eliezer and Barbon made, is we do not average over Hamiltonians here. We don't have this crutch of smearing things with a random J to make nice smooth functions. So we have to ask, what output are we going to get for the ZZ star function? Well, it's going to be rather erratic. So as a model, as a guide to what to expect, we can take the SYK model for a fixed J configuration. So we did that. And this is what you get. All right. This blue line is the first data I showed you, 90 samples of our best n equals 34 data. This red stuff is one sample. I point out that the red stuff oscillates a lot more than the blue. Okay. There's a, this is a log scale, right. Um, it, fluctuations on log scales are notoriously hard to read. Trust me by that saying that there's an order one fractional variance of this signal, and with 90 samples, you killed it by about a factor of 10. Okay? And this, is, this fluctuations is a, is a well-known thing in quantum chaos. The slogan is the spectral form factor is not self-averaging. Self-averaging just means you need to take one sample. Here you clearly have to do better. If you ask, what is the autocorrelation uh, time of these jitters, it's very fast. In fact, it's set by the largest energy in the system inverse. For instance, in random matrix theory, it would be the width of the semicircle. In SYK, it would be the band of allowed energies at that temperature. That uh, width would be the square root of n. The energy is order n. The width is square root of n times a characteristic scale. This is, this is actually wrong. It's temperature squared over J. But in any event, the width in energy is large. This correlation time is very short. So when you're looking for a signal, you can just average over windows here, beat down the statistical noise very effectively. Remember, this is supposed to be an exponentially long time. 
you have lots of windows you can put in there. And so the time average signal you expect to be a smooth feature of the theory. Again, this idea of averaging is important. Quantum chaos people do this all the time. They average over energy or time windows to get a smooth uh, function that they can start making predictions of. Well, how do we calculate the ramp? Sorry, the, the, uh, sorry, the ramp first we have to talk about. One difference between this system and SYK is that the super yang mills theory can have enormous entropy. You know, SYK just had uh, N, N Majorana fermions. You cannot have an entropy bigger than two to the N. Super yang mills theory can have an arbitrarily high entropy. It's a quantum field theory. Its entropy goes like inverse beta cubed. It grows with temperature. So you can have an arbitrarily high plateau. In some sense, that's good. It makes it easy to look for the signal we're, we're thinking about. But because the entropy varies rapidly with energy, you have lots of different kinds of slopes and plateaus. The, the, the plateau time depends on the characteristic energy spacing. In different energy width slices, they would vary. So you have to slice up the energy region in different slices, take a plateau and ramp for each slice, and then add them up. This is a standard pr procedure in thinking about quantum co chaos called unfolding. You, you take out the slow fact that energies vary smoothly, use that to, to change the normalization of this fine grain stuff, and then add it back up. When you do that, you find that this ramp function isn't just linearly in time. It's got this interesting thing folded on it that actually makes the ramp a little higher than you would have expected. So that's what the ramp should look like in super yang mills theory. The hardest thing is to think about the slope, the early time stuff. Well, we should just compute the partition function of super yang mills theory in this gravitational limit and then analytically continue in time. Well, the dominant saddle is the Euclidean black hole. Just analytically continue its action as a function of time. This was z over n squared over beta cubed at zero time. Just took beta to beta plus i t. Well, zz star drops extremely rapidly. At times of order beta, this magnitude drops below one. It's kind of like the Hawking page transition in time rather than temperature. And there's another saddle, the thermal ADS saddle, starts dominating. And as a function of real time, the thermal ADS saddle, roughly it's made of a finite number of oscillators, it, it just wiggles in time. But its magnitude is order one. Well, this story seemed quite simple, but in fact, when you look into it, things are a little more complicated because time is really not like beta. In fact, if you track this saddle, uh, the magnitude goes way down, but then at very long time, it starts coming back up. And in fact, it, it levels out at very long time at e to the n squared with a coefficient of order one, not a coefficient of order one over beta cubed. Think of beta as tiny, so you're at enormous entropy. It looks like the one over n corrections are large here, but it's still a, 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 a confusing pattern to us. And I'd be interested for insights that people have. A further complication is that other saddles could be involved. There's a small ADS black hole, the high energy, essentially Schwarzschild black hole. In this case, let's say you take the small 10D black hole. Well, we took that approximation and followed it, a 10-dimensional small black hole in, in ADS space. And there, its action starts out exponentially unfavorable, but then, it pops back up to something like that, and then it starts exponentially decaying in time. So there's a complicated pattern here that's a challenge to unravel. And we haven't, and there are other things that, that will be included. We, we certainly can't claim to have done that. And we should say that uh, D equals three, where you have a lot of control over these saddles, might be a promising arena, and, and my colleagues Ethan Dyer and Guy Gurari are, are working this out. D is the bulk space-time dimension. So it's a boundary one plus one dimensional conformal field theory. Sorry, I, I should have been explicit. 
Well, so to estimate the dip time, even though we don't have a conclusive analysis, we can ask when these two estimates, zz star of order one or zz star of order e to the n squared with a unit coefficient, when do they intersect the ramp? Well, if the slope is uh, order one, it intersects the ramp at a dip time that's e to the n squared with a very tiny coefficient. Remember, beta is 0.01 or something. Exponential time, but with a tiny coefficient. In this choice, the, it, it uh, intersects the, the ramp at a time e to the n squared with one coefficient. In both cases, the plateau time is e to the n squared over beta cubed. Beta is tiny. So this ratio is extremely small. There's an enormous hierarchy. So again, there would be an exponentially long time between the gravitational regime, the region described by known gravity effects, and this plateau where spectral rigidity controls the dynamics of the system. It seems likely that at long time, this intermediate but long time, super yang mills theory and bulk quantum gravity is run by spectral rigidity. Well, what are the implications of this for bulk quantum gravity? And the short answer is I don't really know. I think I've tried to at least convince you that it's plausible that the late time dynamics of horizon fluctuations, what this observer sees as waves are relaxing onto the horizon, is governed by random matrix dynamics. In particular, there's this novel intermediate region where spectral rigidity describes the dynamics of the system. Now suppose you have a non-perturbative theory of bulk quantum gravity. That is not a boundary description, but a non-perturbative bulk description. Complete, the complete description using bulk variables. It has to contain this, okay? It has to describe the ramp and the plateau. How could it do that? Well, we don't know, but here's a research program. In this SYK simple model, we have an exact non-perturbative rewrite of the model. It's this integral over two bilocal fields with a known action. This has to describe the ramp and the plateau because it's just a rewrite. What part of this G sigma functional integral accounts for this behavior? And if we knew that, we might be able to generalize to systems like uh, super yang mills and Einstein gravity and its completion. Well, toward this, uh, this research program, we don't know the answer, but let me make some general comments. We're trying to describe in energy space this pair correlation function, which is one minus sine squared over this energy difference squared. In the ramp region, we forget the sine squared and we have one minus one over L squared energy differences. In random matrix theory, the rank of the matrix is L. This is just perturbative in random matrix theory. You compute this by just doing standard random matrix perturbation theory. A tough planar diagrams, or first correction to planar diagrams. But L is e to the n. So one over L squared, which is perturbative in random matrix theory, is non-perturbative in SYK non-perturbative in one over n. So again, it's important to have a model where you have an n and an l. We have a one over n expansion, but we're, and we're looking for something non-perturbative in n, but it's somehow perturbative in these random matrix dynamics. Well, a possible candidate, I think Juan first mentioned, is that this could be a saddle point. We have reasons to believe that a single new saddle point is not going to do the job. But it's possible it could be a sum over lots of interesting saddles. We don't know, and we're, we're looking at that. If this is the case, there's a very interesting question that comes up. Because at long enough time, the sine squared comes back to haunt us. What does sine squared of L mean? Well, the typical thing you do is you analytically continue an energy, make this imaginary energy. The sine squared turns into e to the minus L times the energy difference. But this is e to the minus e to the n. So the plateau is not some sim simple saddle point. It's somehow like the exponential error in an infinite sum of instanton contributions. It's going to be an extremely subtle phenomenon. 
in, in this bulk theory? Well, perhaps as an alternate proposal that's appropriate to the day, another alternative we've played with is that there's a kind of cyber duality going on. Not in the infrared, but at late real time, where you don't focus on low energies, but small energy differences, if such a thing makes sense. Perhaps at late small energy differences, and there are hints of this, the one over expansion breaks down. Things become strongly coupled. And if that's the case, there could be a new weakly coupled description with one over L as the weak coupling and random matrix style variables as the new effective variables. Then these things could be perturbative corrections in those new variables. And these e to the minus L effects could be an ordinary instanton. And in fact, in random matrix theory, that effect is known to be described by an interesting instanton. It's a single eigenvalue instanton called the Andreev Altschuler instanton. So this is a, another proposal that we're exploring. We can make models that work like this, but in making models of models, one, is, one has to worry about being caught in an infinite regress. Okay. Well, we hope to have things to say about this sometime in the future. To pick a date out of the hat, let's aim for this date. Okay. Well, that finishes what I have to say, but there is one more duty that remains to me as the final speaker. And that's, I would like to invite all of you to join me in wishing Nadi a very happy birthday. Questions for Steve? Yeah, Steve, in uh, flat space or de Sitter space or for very small black holes in yes. ADS space, the black hole decays yes. on time scales much shorter than yes. most of the time scales you've been talking about. Yes. So do you think that much of this is relevant to those black holes? No. Or? No. End of story. End of story. So uh, what changes in your analysis of ZZ star if you look at uh, weakly coupled young mills instead of strongly coupled young mills? Um, very weakly coupled young mills is, is a subtle situation because you have a hierarchy of scales. You have the, the rather coarse gaps between uh, energy levels given by the almost integral system. But there will be a fine scale given by the fact that the system eventually interacts and is chaotic. But so there'll be another parameter in the level spacing. You'll have like coarse spacings and fine spacings given by uh, the, param the Atuf coupling. So there'll be nothing essential that will change, but it'll just be very, you won't be able to analyze it in perturbation theory because this process of thermalization will, is a non-perturbative. And so the small parameter will not help you in a, in a substantial way. Even uh, theories like uh, theory with a one over n coupling constant will eventually thermalize, but the pattern of gaps will be, will be extremely hard to understand. So, so I, I think the answer is nothing essential, but you don't gain anything uh, fr from it. Maybe I'm wrong, actually, but uh, yes. This is probably stupid, but... <laughs> Can you make the model more complicated by adding, say, a psi square in addition to the psi to the fourth or maybe psi to the sixth? You can, you the, can do all of that. Or in the model for model uh, to pick a random example, take m to the fourth and maybe tune to a critical point there to resonate with things from your past? Or, yes, or will it just make this whole thing uh, hopelessly complicated? Well, you certainly can do that. And in fact, there is some simplicity where you take, uh, in your language, uh, the number of size, take that number very large. This is this parameter Q that Juan was mentioning. There is some simplicity where you take, in your language, a highly multi-critical theory like phi to the two million. That theory has some simplicity perturbatively. What it means for the fine-grained structure is actually an interesting question that we're not sure about. We, we believe that the ultimate fine-grained structure should not matter. For instance, the chaos exponent is independent of Q. 
but it may, might make some other parts of the analysis, for, in, for instance, the slope, this, this very confusing perturbative region at the beginning, easier to analyze. And so that might give us a lever there, although we haven't figured out how to use it yet. I mean, as an example, uh, at finite Q, the, the function of beta is actually a rather complicated analytic function, but it becomes meromorphic at infinite Q. And that's easier to think about analytically continuing. But we, we, haven't, we haven't figured out a way to really effectively exploit that, that tool yet. Okay, let's uh, close the conference and thanks Steve again. <laughs>